Ah, hello. So this video is a week three summary video. Um, I'm going to just focus on the Alderman text and the Federici text, and I'm going to try to keep it kind of short, um, mainly because I noticed I only have three people participate in this discussion, which is kind of a bummer, um, because this is sort of like, no, nah, I mean, the preacher coming out, I, the week, the week four, um, discussion seems to be like more more participation i think maybe people are catching on a little bit better but i hope that this is was the avenue to reach uh finally the culmination of the sorcerer's sale so i'm a little bummed that i didn't get more participation in this discussion um so i'll try to keep it short let's just look at what the discussion um was supposed to be about um so i'll share my screen really quick so the as I pointed out in this discussion, is that I wanted you to look at sort of the idea of speculative fiction um, and maybe how that's different uh, from Okafor's definition of science fiction as political writing. I wanted to try to keep that idea of the what if that she mentioned in her TED talk and how does that fall into speculative fiction. Um, most of what was said, I think people went online and kind of looked what it meant, uh, but generally uh, when we think about speculative fiction, uh, Margaret Atwood is probably the one of the leaders of specul speculative fiction, um, and it's the idea that moving away from the slipstream that I mentioned in the Afrofuturism or the indigenous futurism, um, speculative fiction is way more what used to be called, and I think maybe still uh, is called hard science fiction. Um, it's the idea that it uses a lot of technology or innovation that is likely um, that's based on what is happening today what could what could most likely happen um, so it's not really imagining a whole new world or like a whole new form of power structures necessarily um, but it's saying like what if we just um, tweaked this thing or what if this were to happen as the idea like this thing got out or whatever it is um, uh, if you ever read, if you, I don't know if you, anybody has read the Matt Adams series that Margaret Atwood did, um, the first one, Orcs and Crake, where it imagines a world where this uh, genius kid, um, and they're already involved in a world with, with high innovation, where like a lot of things that we do today are sort of put on blast, and it's like, hey, look at all the stuff we can do. Um, and the world's all separated by these sort of hyper industrial and hyper advanced uh, city states that are connected by like a speed train and everything like that. Anyway, but they, the idea is like, what if this world were to exist where uh, suddenly um, sort of gene engineering or genetic engineering um, and sort of uh, the and microbiology kind of met you know, to form like a whole new uh, like, or I should say like hyper species and like, um, what does that look like on a, a really a, I want to say like uh, a disease level, I suppose. I don't know what to say, but like on a like a bacterial level and all of that. So anyway, but that so the idea of speculative fiction is to present the like, what if we just took something that work that's do, being done today, like, or that is being studied today, and then like it just happened. Um, and so that doesn't mean it's not what is happening. And like, hello, Moto, is the idea? Well, you know, there's what if we had you know the idea of coding moving into like neural networks and then uh neural networks becoming sort of like part of a a cloud uh ne like a like a cloud neural network that could then have knock-on effects of like having sort of this but it's that that last step that sort of like whatever you mentioned is the sort of the magical part of hello moto where suddenly they're sucking out the essence of the people around them that that doesn't really fall into speculative fiction. That's a that's sort of the leap uh, that Okafor is making, um, and the same with like um, Harrison's Mindscape, um, the idea of like that giant alien barrier coming down onto Earth. That really wouldn't be a part of speculative fiction um, because it's so outside the realm of uh, like theoretical science. It's um, so like nobody's really studying what if a giant alien barrier came and landed on the earth and separated all the other political aspects that happen around the barrier. Now those are more speculative fiction, uh, like the rise of the Vermittlers and the ghost dancers. That's all speculative fiction stuff uh, because those are like real hard cultural 
um, aspects that um, could rise to power in some way, um, as such as aldermen presenting like, well, what if there was this evolutionary change in women where they began to grow this skein um, around their collarbone that uh, offered that allowed them then to uh, develop electrical pulses out of their hands, um, and so this is this is bordering on speculative fiction. Um, and I just wanted to present the idea: is like, is do you do what do you look at this? Like, does it seem different uh, from um, Hello Moto and from Mindscape? Um, and the idea that it's sort of the the power that is involved in there. So it's flipping the world um, kind of on its head by presenting a, um, a biological d development. And this is where I really wanted you to zoom in here. You know, I explain, I asked you to second, explain how the power represents science, magic, and religion. Well, the science part I think is uh, is interesting in this in this book um, because there's a one there's one section and I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna switch my screen new share. Sorry, I'm gonna screw this up for a second. New share. Um, and if you go, I'm on the wrong place. So this was the, I because I'm looking at this as an EPUB edition, so you guys, I give you EPUB editions, or I give you PDFs. This is when um, you get the, it's right after this bit here um, about Ali and Roxanne coming together. Um, and it shows the picture of this like uh, training thing that was used to help uh, women sort of develop their abilities. And this was an interesting aspect of the science as well. These archeological pieces that are found throughout the book um, to sort of, you know, what, how did you think about those as uh, part of the science of the book? That makes it way more in the speculative fiction realm. It's like uh, the story starts with, you know, the, there's this sort of archivist who is uh, trying, you know, submits the story to uh, another author to ask for their, you know, how do they feel about uh, this text? Can you give feedback? Um, and so there's, and we'll get into that relationship in just a minute. But the idea that, and then throughout it, there's these sort of like these pictures of, of archeological evidence um, that pertain to an era that um, was sort of, I think it was called the cataclysm. And sort of it's when all of these power, this power dynamic actually shifted. And these things are uh, what was developed in, so it says like approximately 1500 years old, the device for training and the use of electrostatic power the handle at the base is iron um, and is connected within the wooden frame, metal peg, right? So you have all this, uh, this would require a degree of control, presumably the practice size suggests the device was meant for 13 to 15 year old girls discovered in Thailand. So the whole description is exactly like you would find in any sort of like sort of archeological book. Um, you know, the, it gives a really clear, like just distilled, you know, dispassionate description of the, what, you know, what the device was meant for, uh, what, where it was discovered, you know, all this stuff and pertaining directly to the development of the power, right? So you get this like feeling like, oh, wow, this is really grounded in sort of a history, right? There's a history that's there. And it sort of, and it presents us with that more what if, what if uh, at one point in our history, there, there was a development where uh, women had the ability to um, dom physically dominate men. What would happen? What would there be a difference? And so this is this is this, you know the idea that the book treats the science in this way is that there's a history behind it. Um, it's not it it helps um, or maybe it like destabilize. I should say it destabilizes our sense of reality, um, making it much more in the realm of like well, it gives you this feeling of questioning your own culture, right? Uh, because you're being faced with these cultural artifacts. Um, and then how do we read our own cultural artifacts? I'm meant to look at one thing, but I just want to jump to the, another thing really quick. I have to move this screen really fast um, because I'm talking about the, the I know she probably should just ask you to look at the graphics and that's it because the graphics are so compelling. Um, do, 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 do. I don't remember the exact place that this is, but it's really significant. And we're gonna roll forward really fast to find, I think it's at the end. Dun, 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 dun. 
No, that's way at the end. It was at the end. I'm gonna do a search. Sorry, this is taking so long. Uh, da, da, no, that's not the one. Here, uh, this um, there's these two um, these two artifacts are actual representations of real artifacts that are found, and this one um, in particular is significant. Um, if you guys remember your world civilizations classes, uh, this is an actual representation from the ancient Indian civilization of Harappa, um, and. What's funny about it is that I believe that the reason Alderman used this, she had to use this on purpose, um, was that there's like the reading of the original artifact is that it's female and like a female servant. It's all, the entire reading of this is so misogynistic in the actual archeological evidence of this artifact. And so Alderman just totally flips it on its head and says, well, what if we just read this as a male artifact and like a male servant? You know, she describes it in here, statue of serving boy, and it's totally the opposite. Um, and found in the same horde as the priestess queen, right, from the previous, uh, you know, from the careful grooming and sensuous features. This is it's exactly like the originals described, like man, careful grooming, sensuous figures. It's been speculated that this statue depicts a sex worker, right? So it's like, originally, like, what if this is how men were viewed and it's it gives it that sense of how does science uh in the form of history archaeology um just like our our ability to like uh, decipher what it is that humans have created what if it were just what if we just shift the lens and say, well everything that we thought was women is men um you know how would we how would we interpret our reality and that's really why i wanted you to read this um is to think well our, when we when we look at science, magic, and religion, we interpret the idea of science. We're thinking, well, science is as it is, right? It presents us with the facts, and that it's our it's our view of reality it makes a lot of sense. But the the text, a text like this, when you're reading it, and you think, well, yeah, it's just a throwaway fiction text. That's fine. You can believe that. But just imagining this text is a way to review the world, um, review the artifacts that we think about, the and the way that we make assumptions about the the cultures in the past and who we were in the past and what that means for us today. Uh, you know, a lot of times people, and, and when we think about, and this is where I want to kind of move into religion, but I'm going to look really quick again at science. But the idea is that most of the time when we think about like religion, um, it's, you know, that the traditional belief that it's grounded in something that happened, you know, if you're, if you're Jewish um, or even Christian, those, those traditions are grounded in something that happened 5,000 years ago. You know, if, if you're, and so you're, you're, you are keeping your entire reality um, onto a 5,000 year old lens, uh, you know, and if, if you're a Christian, you're, you know, you don't believe in, in Judaism, you know, you at least hold on to the, the New Testament and you ground your religious faith in something that happened or is believed to have happened 2,000 years ago. And so I'm not undercutting tradition. It's just that that's a lens. Um, and we have to see like that lens is just as significant or as influential as a lens of science. And I'm not saying science is, should be because viewed as a magician, it's certainly, and is should be viewed as something that uh, allows us to sort of strip away tradition and look at things for what they actually are. And it, this is what we're advancing in this class is the idea that when we think about science, magic, and religion, uh, we're not looking at them as a hierarchy um, where you have science on top and the religion and the magic. And you say, okay, we can rely on science and Religion helps us, you know, be moral, but, and then magic is, ah, it's fun, and, um, you know, it's, it's entertaining, but it really holds nothing for us other than the, that level. It's like, well, no, that's not what this class is about. The meaning of this class is to say, well, let's hold them as something that is uh, more horizontal. It's not hierarchical. Let's say, well, we have science, we have magic, we have religion, and all of these things are just ways of interpreting the world. And I, that's where they wanted you to read this text because I, I believe that's what it really forces you to do. And you have the Book of Eve, you have this whole religion that revolves, that uh, is created around uh, Ali and her becoming Mother Eve. 
Um, but if we go back to the science, and I'll just, just want to take a look at this really quick, and then we'll look at the idea of E uh, in just a second. Um, but if we go all the way back to, oh, the archival. So, and this is another aspect. Archival documents relating to the electrostatic power, its origin, dispersal, and its possibility of a cure. This is, this is I think, a huge part, part of why this book is held together. I'm not saying that you can't just imagine this social change, but what Alderman does here is says, well, if we're going to have this power, and there needs to be a clear origin. There needs to be a reason for this sort of advancement in uh, biology where like there is just this shocking change. And so she presents these archival evidence of this stuff being put in water that changes uh, body structure and leads to, you know, it, it's, it happened during uh, wartime. It's almost like uh, watching an X or reading an X or like X-Men comic or something like that, you know, like reading a mutant comic. Um, and then, you know, you have this idea of, you know, you have this personal defender, uh, you know, the idea of where this comes from uh, when, um, and the, you know, increase your power with this weird trick, defensive slip on under socks. So this idea that you would have this, uh, there was obviously like a growth of uh, this happening where women were showing that they were, the skein was, skein was growing and then they were developing this power and then there was these ways to combat the power. Um, and uh, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that pull together the narrative? Uh, but it's also the way in which we interpret the world. It's like, well, this archival evidence gives us this sort of scientific view, like, oh, well, now we have a reason to believe the story. Um, and so I think that's significant in the idea of it making it more speculative fiction than it is would would be considered um, the more uh, futurism or this idea of like uh, you know sort of like the slipstream idea. Um, obviously, it's not, it's it's staying pretty true to a world that has existed, uh, but it's remaking this world even from even in the idea of interpreting it as being way in the future, um, sort of like Star Star Trek level or beyond. Um, and then thinking about how you know human development up until then. Uh, if any fan, any fans of Star Trek: The Next Generation, I assume you appreciated this uh, because most of the early Star Trek: Next Generation is basically holding uh, the earlier generations of humans on trial for being so barbaric. Um, and so, if you enjoy that aspect of the book, uh, you should check out uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation. Uh, so. Other than that, um, the idea, the Book of Eve is significant. You have the religion that grows up around um, Eve and Allie, and, and the idea that her, her, the religious fervor around her being this mother um, leads to this political turmoil uh, that uh, it ends in the cataclysm, this whole hostility. And that's significant. As, so Alderman reads that line and says, well, it's not just about the scientific development, it's about the political development that happens, the, this religious fervor around uh, the pal that power that Ali develops um, in her own understanding of her electrostatic ability. Um, and then it, if we just look at the beginning, because I didn't give you all of the book, when it comes to that, the idea that the book opens with a passage from the Book of Eve. And you have the artifacts there showing the Book of Eve, but you have uh, one, there's, it starts with a, with a passage from actual Holy Bible, right? Um, you know, this idea, Samuel said to them, place a king over us to guide us. And Samuel said to them, this is what a king will do if it reigns over you, he'll take your sons and make them, make, make them run with his chariots and horses. He'll dispose them however he wants, he'll make them commanders and thousands. Of captains, of, so you have this, this, um, and then the Lord answered, "Give them a king, right?" And this is you have this is what religion does. This is all them saying. Well, if we if we make someone if we give someone this power, um, it's going to be if the people will ask for this power, and if the people are given this power, um, then it's going to lead to bloodshed. It's going to lead to this whole, and so that's sort of Alderman's take is that religious fervor leads to blood. It leads to people asking for somebody to reign over them. It makes them want to move this uh, into a really destructive area. And then you have um, Neil Adam Arman, obviously. Uh, Naomi Alderman's name is a, as an anagram. And then 
uh, the Book of Eve, the idea we're down at the bottom, we are electrical, the power travels within us as it does with nature, my children, nothing has happened here that has not been in accordance with the natural law, right? And so you have this idea of bringing together uh, this religious perspective of, in terms of, uh, with evolution. So this scientific development is, well, this is all natural for us to gain such a power. And then it ends with, she cupped the lightning in her hands, she commanded it to strike. Um, so it's just this certainty that women are given such dominance over the earth, uh, very much like the early New Old Testament, um, in which um, men are given the power to dominate the world and um, to go forth and and procreate and dominate the animals of uh, the animals and the, the natural world. Uh, where in this case, it's no the domination isn't there. The ocean cannot survive without its trickles, nor steadfast tree trunks without budlets, nor the enthroned brain without nerve endings. As above, so below as on the outskirts, so at the very heart. So it's this bringing in of um, all things together, this connection to so this memory of a, of a completely connected world um, that's totally different from the world we live in today where uh, Calvinism has just divided it up into the electorate and the preterite who can and cannot have. Um, and we never dug into Calvinism, but I'm, in the future, I, I hope what I'm hoping is that this book sort of helps inform your thinking about the idea of science and, and religion, not so much magic going on, but you could you could get it there. Anyway, uh, if we move from there into the Federici text, which I'm gonna do a different share into Federici, and I'll try to be quick about this. Um, inner text, so I gave you the chapters, so it's part two, and it's chapters six and seven. Um, I think what I, what's significant about this, I actually did sort of like, what does she say that uh, no one else is saying here? And I think what she's saying that no one else is saying is um, when we get into this, you know, she's saying that this is, I think this is significant here. She's saying that this is happening, um, that the reason that Alderman is imagining this world is because we live in a world where women are murdered on a, on a regular basis um, for being women and for questioning power and for having power. Um, that women, you know, this idea that since, you know, March 1976, that there's been a true prune on the crimes against women. Um, and we're still dealing with this horrible reality today. And I think what F Federici's trying to point out is um, that every day we see more and more um, the, you know, we believe, oh, well, women have become, have come so far. Oh, in, in the United States, I think we think, oh, well, there's been such a great liberation of women. Um, but if we look, around the world, um, we suddenly see like, I guess we get this sort of like mirror held up to say, well, are we making advances? Um, if, if this is still happening in a place, like in these African countries like Kenya or Ghana or in Central African Republic, um, you know, she, she refers to, and if I, if we go down, um, she talks about, all this happening in the mid 20th century, the 60s and 70s. Um, but then, you know, she starts talking about how uh, to understand the logic whereby militias in the diamond, coal, tan, and copper fields of the Democratic Republic of Congo shoot their pistols into women's vaginas or Guatemalan soldiers have ripped open pregnant women's bellies with knives in, in what continues to be portrayed as the counterinsurgency war, right? This is stuff she's saying, these are, these are reports that are happening today, right? Around the world, we hear of uh, women who became this idea who, and it's been sanctioned by, by institutions like the World Bank. Both communal land tenure and subsistence agriculture have come under heavy institutional attack, criticized by the World Bank as one of the causes of global poverty under the assumption that land is a dead asset unless it's legally registered or uses collateral to obtain bank loans with which to start some entrepreneurial activity. Um, so the idea that women would have power that is communal um, but that is undercut by the policies of the World Bank that's seeking to develop countries' GDP. Um, and so women end up in a situation where they become um, sort of secondary to the development of the country because they're working to keep the communal relations going. Uh, but we're, institutions like the World Bank don't really care about communal relations. They only care about um, the assets that can be developed within the land. Um, and so when we think about what Federici is saying in this chapter, and then if we go into chapter 
Um, chapter seven, um, when it's, she's you know talking about it today, is she she refers to um, all of these witch killings that are happening all over uh, the you know all over the continent of Africa, um, and this happening because of globalization. You know, she talks about how women going missing in Ciudad Juarez. Um, she talks about all these instances in which there's horrible violence being perpetrated against women. Um, and when we think about the what if that is presented to us by uh, Okafor or by uh, Harrison or by Alderman, it's, it's imagining a world in which these things don't happen or that, that, that where these, this, these atrocities against women are um i guess there's something that is we've moved beyond that we can't accept anymore um and to have like approximately three thousand women who are now exiled in witch camps in northern ghana forced to flee their communities under the threat of death that sounds exactly like the world of that alderman's mentioned but even that sounds like you know it's mentioned by okafor in halomoto that there's a riot going on um in the in the north in Nigeria, sort of near that area uh, that we would call uh, Ghana, Ghana or Benin and uh, and um, and Togo and uh, and Ghana being right there, that idea that we would have this sort of like chaos happening um, in the north, right? So it's always in the north. In the north of Ghana, you think is Burkina Faso, and you think, well, that's connected to um, the the chaos that we, you know, sort of connected to Harrison. What does that mean to us that sort of this idea that uh, sort of this, cha this chaos going on, women being held uh, for being witches in the Northern area. So we have these connections that sort of like ground us in these narratives and think, well, the possibilities are still there. They're, they're not outrageous, um, but the world that we want, the world that Okafor and Harrison want and Alderman want is a world that Federici is, um, is saying is the opposite, you know, it's the Federici is sort of saying, yeah, like we, your cries are, are, are heard. Uh, but the reality is that this is happening. And for us to, we're, Federici is basically not, she's not saying what if, she's saying what is. And so it's, you have this contrast. So what is and what if just hitting each other. Um, and I think that's where we find this idea that it's so political, so significantly political, reading these things together and saying, well, this is the world we're living in. This is the world that we maybe want or should we have this world? Is, is, that, is that world the world that's going to get rid of the things that Federici is talking about? And so that's what I wanted you to think about when you're reading these texts together. Um, and I hope that's helpful and something to think about. There's so much more we could do. I mean, you could spend an entire class reading these texts um, together and so I hope you enjoyed looking at them. We're going to look at talk about them a little bit more later on. We're going to watch a, the short film that was created about um, Hello Moto called Hello Rain um, and have and bring all this back together. And also in my summary video of The Preacher, I hope um, for the week four, I'll, uh, I'll mention all this together again and, and talk about sort of what this, uh, what they all, what I see as them having a connection to and uh, just sort of keeping you thinking about the ideas uh, that were brought forward in this class um, as we move into the, the last few weeks. Okay. So take a seat, take it easy. Bye.